Habit Power. It will change your life. It is a beautiful arrangement in the mental and moral economy of our nature that that which is performed as a duty may, by frequent repetitions, become a habit, and the habit of stern virtue so repulsive to others may hang around the neck like a wreath of flowers. Nothing we ever do is in strict scientific literalness wiped out. There is a tendency in the nervous system to repeat the same mode of action at regularly recurring intervals. If we repeat any kind of mental effort at the same hour daily, we at length find ourselves entering upon it without premeditation when the time approaches. The great thing in all education is to make our mind and body our allies instead of our enemies. We must make automatic and habitual as soon as possible as many useful actions as we can and guard against growing into ways that are likely to be disadvantageous to us as we would guard against disease. The nervous system is a living tape recorder. No sound, however feeble, however slight, can escape being recorded in its wonderful mechanism. Although the molecules of this living machine may all be entirely changed many times during a lifetime, yet these impressions are never erased or lost. They become forever fixed in the character. The young person may say to himself, I will do this just once, just to see what it is like. No one will ever know it, and it won't matter this one time. The young man says it when he drinks, just to be social. In fact, the attitude that says, I'll do this just to see what it is like, has ruined many lives. Many a man has lost his balance and fallen over the precipice into the pit of despair while just attempting to see what it was like. Just one little lie to help me out of this difficulty, one time won't count. Just one little embezzlement, no one will know it, and I can return the money before it will be needed. Just one little indulgence, a good night's sleep will make me all right again. Just one small part of my work cheated, it won't make any great difference. But the truth is, it will be counted, whether you like it or not. The deed has been recorded with an iron pen, even to the smallest detail. The recording angel is no myth, it is found in ourselves. Its name is memory, and it holds everything. We think we have forgotten thousands of things until mortal danger, a sickness, or some other great stimulus reproduces them to the consciousness like high-definition photos. Sometimes all one's past life will seem to pass before him in an instant. But at all times it is really, although unconsciously, passing before him in the sentiments he feels, in the thoughts he thinks, in the impulses that move him. Deep in the very nature of animate existence is that principle of facility and inclination, acquired by repetition, which we call habit. People become enslaved to their constantly repeated acts. In spite of the protests of his weakened will, the trained nerves continue to repeat the acts even when the doer abhors them. What he at first chooses at last compels. Man is as irrevocably chained to his deeds like atoms are linked to gravity. You cannot separate the smallest action from its inevitable effect upon one's character and destiny. Practically all the achievements of the human race are but the accomplishments of habit. Mighty momentum is possible only by the law of the power of habit. We are a great bundle of habits which all our life have been forming. A successful person's habit of industry no doubt is irksome and tedious at first, but practiced so conscientiously and persistently, it has gained such momentum as to astonish the world. The habit of right thinking can make a tiny person powerful. Those who form the habit of cheerfulness, of looking on the bright side of things, can spare themselves from years of undue stress and depression. The habit of positive thinking can transform the most miserable life into one of harmony and beauty. The habit of directing a firm and steady will upon those things which tend to produce harmonious thought can produce happiness and contentment even in the most mundane jobs. Disciplined willpower can drive out all discordant thoughts and produce a life of perpetual harmony. Our trouble is that we do not discipline our will. After one's habits are well set, it's like he can just sit by and observe which way he is going. Habit creates automation. A man who is bound by the mighty cable of habit that was woven from the tiny threads of single acts which he thought were under his control has become a weakened slave to his own grind. 
drop a stone down a cliff. By the law of gravitation, it sinks with rapidly increasing momentum. If it falls 16 feet the first second, it will fall 48 feet the next second, and 80 feet the third second, and 144 feet the fifth second, and if it falls for 10 seconds, it will in the last second rush through 304 feet till Earth stops it. Habit is cumulative. After each act of our lives, we are not the same person as before, but quite another, better or worse, but not the same. There has been something added to or deducted from our weight of character. There is no fault nor folly in your life that will not rise against you and rob you of your joy, strength, and vitality. We get away with nothing. The folly of the child becomes the vice of the youth and then the crime of the man. A study revealed that 147 of a 900-bed prison were there on a second incarceration. What brings inmate back the second, third, or fourth time? It is habit which drives him on to commit the deed which his heart abhors and which his very soul loathes. It is the momentum made up from a thousand deviations from the truth and right, for there is a great difference between going just right and a little wrong. It is the result of that mysterious power which the repeated act has of getting itself repeated again and again. How powerless people are in the presence of a mighty habit, which has robbed them of willpower, of self-respect, of everything human, until they become its slave. Numbed by the fascinations of pleasure, we are often unconscious of pain, while our evil angel amputates the fingers, the feet, and hands, or even the arms and legs of our character. Wrongdoing in its early stages of becoming a habit is not only painless, but often even pleasant. In our great museums, you see stone slabs with the marks of rain that fell hundreds of years before Adam lived, and the footprint of some wild bird that passed across the beach in those ancient times. The passing shower and the light foot left their prints on the soft sediment. Then ages went on, and the sediment hardened into stone, and there the prints remain and will remain forever. So the child, so soft, so susceptible to all impressions, so joyous to receive new ideas, treasures them all up, gathers them all into itself, and retains them forever. And sadly, that good thing is what wars against our very souls when we choose bad habits. Beware of dwelling on wrongdoing, for at each view it is apt to become better looking. Habit is practically, for a middle-aged person, fate. For is it not practically certain that what I have done for 20 years I shall repeat today? What are the chances for a man who has been lazy and indolent all his life starting in tomorrow morning to be industrious and profitable? Zero. Habit tends to make us permanently what we are for the moment. We cannot possibly hear, see, feel, or experience anything which is not woven in the web of character. What we are this minute and what we do this minute, what we think this minute, will be read in the future character as plainly as words spoken into a voice recorder can be reproduced in the future. Every wrong you ever committed becomes your life companion. It rushes to your lips every time you speak and drags its hideous form into your imagination every time you think. It throws its shadow across your path whichever way you turn. You are fastened to it for life and it will cling to you in the vast forever. Do you think yourself free? You are a slave to every wrong you ever committed. They follow your pen and work their own character into every word you write. On the other hand, habits done right make for a powerful life. Rectitude is only the confirmed habit of doing what is right. Some people cannot tell a lie. The habit of truth-telling is fixed. It has become incorporated with their natures. Their characters bear the indelible stamp of veracity. We all know people whose slightest word is unimpeachable. Nothing could shake our confidence in them. There are other men who cannot speak the truth. Their habitual insincerity has made a twist in their characters, and this twist appears in their speech. One mistake too many makes all the difference between safety and destruction. How many people would like to go to sleep poor and wake up wealthy? How many would fain go to bed ignorant and wake up wise? You reap what you have sown. Those who have sown foolishness seeds, vice seeds, laziness seeds always get a crop. They that sow the wind shall reap the whirlwind. Habit, like a child, repeats whatever is done before it. 
Oh, the power of a repeated act to get itself repeated again and again. But, like the wind, it is a power which we can use to force our way in its very teeth, as does the ship, and thus multiply our strength, or we can drift with it without exertion upon the rocks and shoals of destruction. What a great thing it is to start right in life. Everybody can see that the first steps lead to the last, with all except their own. No, his little prevarications and cheating will not make him a liar, but he can see that it surely will in someone else's case. He can see that others are idle and on the road to ruin, but cannot see it in his own case. It's just like the great prophet. Despite his power to foretell the future, he couldn't see his own demise. There is a wonderful relation between bad habits. They all belong to the same family. If you take in one, no matter how small or insignificant it may seem, you will soon have the whole. A man who has formed the habit of laziness or idleness will soon be late to his appointments. A man who does not meet his engagements will dodge, apologize, prevaricate, and lie. I have rarely known a perfectly truthful man who was always late. You have seen a ship out in the bay swinging with the tide and the waves. The sails are all up and you wonder why it does not move, but it cannot, for down beneath the water it is anchored. So we often see a young man apparently well-equipped, well-educated, and we wonder that he does not advance toward manhood and character. But alas, we find that he is anchored to some secret vice and he can never advance until he cuts loose. Thousands can sympathize with David when he cried, My sins have taken such hold upon me that I am not able to look up. My heart faileth me. Like the damned spot of blood on Lady Macbeth's hand, these foul spots on the imagination will not out. What a penalty nature exacts for physical sins. Of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. The habit-forming portion of life is the dangerous period, and we need the discipline of close application to hold us outside of our studies. Washington at 13 wrote 110 maxims of civility and good behavior and was most careful in the formation of all habits. Franklin, too, devised a plan of self-improvement and character building. No doubt the noble characters of these two men, almost superhuman in their excellence, are the natural result of their early care and earnest striving towards perfection. Today society mocks such great men. They remove their statues and try to cancel them from history's memory. A sliver cup was once knocked into a jar of acid a silver cup. It disappeared, was dissolved by the acid, and could not be found. The question came up whether it could ever be found. A great chemist came in and put certain chemicals into the jar, and every particle of the silver was precipitated to the bottom. The mass was then sent to a silversmith, and the cup was restored. So. A precious youth who has fallen into the sink of iniquity, lost, dissolved in sin, can only be restored by the great chemist. What is put into the first years of life is put into the remainder of life. It is the earliest sin that exercises the most influence for evil. Benedict Arnold was the only general in the revolution that disgraced his country. He had great military talent, wonderful energy, and a courage equal to any emergency. But Arnold did not start right. Even when a boy, he was despised for his cruelty and his selfishness. He delighted in torturing insects and birds so he could watch them suffer. He scattered pieces of glass and sharp tacks on the floor of the shop he was tending to cut the feet of the barefooted boys. Even in the army, in spite of his bravery, the soldiers hated him and the officers dared not trust him. Let no man trust the first false step. We deform ourselves with agencies so pleasant that we think we are having a good time until we become so changed and enslaved that we scarcely recognize ourselves. Vice, the pleasant guest which we first invited into our heart's parlor, becomes vulgarly familiar and entrenches herself deep in our very being. We ask her to leave, but she simply laughs at us from the hideous wrinkles she has made in our faces and refuses to go. Our secret sins defy us from the hideous furrows they have cut in our cheeks. Each impure thought has chiseled its autograph deep into the forehead, too deep for erasure, and the glassy, bleary eye adds its testimony to our ruined character. 
The devil does not apply his match to logs, but he first lights the kindling wood of innocent sins. Sin is gradual. It does not break out on a man until it has long circulated through his system. Murder, adultery, theft are not committed in deed until they have been committed in thought again and again. That which is written upon the human soul can never be removed, for the tablet is immortal. What man, young, old, or middle-aged, reaps what he sows? The only thing to do with wild oats is to put them carefully into the hottest part of the fire and get them burnt to dust, every seed of them. If you sow them, no matter in what ground, up they will come with long, tough roots and luxuriant stalks and leaves, as sure as there is a sun in heaven. The devil, too, whose special crop they are, will see that they thrive, and you and nobody else will have to reap them. Young man, beware of his example. Keep thyself pure. Observe the laws of your physical nature, and the most unrelaxing industry will never rob you of a month's health nor shorten the thread of your life. For industry and health are companions, and long life is the heritage of diligence.